I'm not sure how it happened, but I, I spoke on Mother's Day as well, and now I'm here on Father's Day, and we'll be discussing um, a parable. Um, if you turn in your Bibles to the 25th chapter of Matthew, we'll talk a little bit about um, <clears throat> the parable of the wise and foolish virgin, virgins. And we'll read the text to start off with today. Starting in uh, chap uh, verse 1 of chapter 25. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell oil and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was closed. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, open up to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. This parable, which, as it says in uh, one of our Sunday school rooms here, is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So what is that? It kind of speaks for itself, but it's a story that Jesus would tell that would allow his followers to understand what was going on. There was a reason that Jesus spoke in parables, and the use of parables goes back much further in history than Jesus. Parables were common in, uh, a common thing in Judaic teaching, teaching traditions, uh, even further back in the Old Testament. The reason Joe, uh, Jesus spoke in parables was so that the disciples would hear and understand, but also, and there was another reason, but also, and this may be awkward to understand, it was also that, so those who were not followers of Jesus those who didn't really care what he is saying would not understand the teaching. It seems odd to us. It's a weird concept to us that Jesus would teach in a way where people would not understand. <clears throat> but that's what our scripture tells us. After Jesus, whom at one point in his ministry came to use parables pretty much exclusively, uh, presented the parable of the seed in the soils, Jesus had pulled away from the crowd, the Bible tells us, with his disciples, and they asked him, Lord, why do you speak in parables? And here's what his answer was, and this is Matthew 13, uh, verse 11 through 17. He answered and said to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have abundance, but whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. I would say this is a difficult teaching. Therefore, I speak to them in parables because seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, hearing you will hear and not understand and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of his people have grown dull and their ears are hard of hearing and their eyes have been closed lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they shall see, and your ears, for they hear. For assuredly I say to you that um, many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see but did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. So... In this particular earthly story with heavenly meaning, we read about 10 virgins that were waiting for the bridegroom. And the very word bridegroom 
indicates what kind of an occasion this was. This was a wedding, a very special event. The ancient Jewish marriage process is a little involved, a little complex, but in it, it is in itself a wonderful picture of what we would call the blessed hope or the idea of the rapture um, that we read about. We can read about that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, but I won't make you go there. So we're going to take a little detour and talk a little bit about a, a Jewish wedding, ancient Jewish wedding. And, you know, I may have cared less about weddings <clears throat> when my daughter was eight or nine years old, but now that she's 19 or 20, going to be 20 soon, I um, am a little more concerned about the concept of a wedding. When the young man, the first stage of the wedding, and there's four stages that we can talk about, is the contract. When a young man desired to marry a young woman or the groom's father had chosen a young woman for his son to marry, he'd prepare a contract or a covenant to present to the young woman and her father at the young woman's house. The contract contained a statement of his willingness to provide for the young woman uh, and described the terms under which he would propose marriage. Part of this was the inclusion of a, what they called a bride price the price that the young man was willing to pay to the father in order to marry the young woman. This was actually the most important part of the contract. The payment was to be made to the girl's father in exchange for his permission to marry her. Generally, the cost was fairly significant. The bride price compensated the girl's family for the cost of raising her, but it also indicated the love that the young man had for the young lady. Probably not what we would consider super romantic, but it is what it is. The second stage of this process <clears throat> was the betrothal. So when the terms were agreed upon, there would be a betrothal ceremony, and there was uh, this ceremony, and then there was probably some wine served. And the betrothal, like, unlike modern engagements, was a legally binding thing. If you'll remember, in the nativity story, when Mary found out she was pregnant, Joe ta Joseph, Joe, like my friend Joe, uh, Joseph talked about putting her away quietly and divorcing her. And that kind of gives us a picture of what the process was like. But during the betrothal, it was legally binding. You were committed, but the marriage was not yet consummated. Um, the only way to dissolve a betrothal agreement was either the father could uh, dissolve it, usually for some kind of cause, or the death of one of the parties. So this was a serious, serious legal agreement. <clears throat> the third section, third part of this process is the wait. After the betrothal ceremony and wine and party of betrothal and the agreement or ketubah what they call it was signed uh, the groom would return to his father's house and he'd work to build an addition to his father's house or in some cases if they were wealthy would build a dwelling somewhere on his father's property and what it was is it was a wedding chamber for his bride he would continue to work a lengthy period of time there was, uh, the scholars were saying that there were occasions that they knew of through documentation that it exceeded a year. So <clears throat> for sometimes over a year, the groom would be building this to his father's uh, specifications. This chamber would be where the bride and groom would spend seven solid days. So it had to be a beautiful, beautiful place. It was a representation of the love of the groom for the bride. And then finally, we get to the fourth stage, which is the actual wedding. So only when the groom's father had approved of the work, right? The groom's father would, was the guy who called the shots. And uh, I kind of would like it better if it was the bride's father that called the shots, but it, I can live with it this way. The groom's father would call the shots. 
Anyway, when he approved of the work, only then would permission be given to his son to go and retrieve the bride. So if somebody were to ask the groom when the wedding was, uh, almost exactly word for word, the, the, the groom would say, it is not for me to know. Only my father knows. Now the bride, interestingly, had no idea when this period of time was going to be over. So she had to be ready the entire time. She had attendance. So she waited expectantly for the groom. She, again, she had no idea. Is this starting to flesh out the picture of the rapture and how we're waiting for the rapture? So the bride had to be ready day and night. The woman who would attend her would also have to be ready, and they'd keep an eye out for the coming of the bridegroom. And they would then accompany them to the wedding celebration. Does this kind of make sense of how we're waiting for our Savior, right? So this is where we make our way back to the parable. In history, there's some controversy when it comes to this parable because there's a lot of argument over time about uh, what the story that Jesus was telling actually means. One thing that we know for absolute certainty, that we have absolute certainty about, is that the bridegroom referred to is Jesus Christ. Matthew 25, 1, going back to the, to the parable, said, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now, normally, the bridegroom, along with some close friends, would leave his home and go to the bride's home where there would be various ceremonies. It was very involved, very complex process that the uh, that the ancient Jews went through. These 10 virgins in this parable may have been attending the bride and have likely been there the entire time. They would live with the bride. Uh, it's, it's kind of a version of what we would consider bridesmaids, but it's expected that they will meet the groom when he comes to the bride's house. It was expected that everyone in the procession would carry their own lit torch. And there was a couple of reasons for this. One is almost this always occurred at night. It was always night when the groom would go and re retrieve, I guess, the bride. So one was that they needed light to see. But if there was someone in the group who was not carrying a torch, but with the group, it would be an indicator that they were either possibly a wedding crasher or someone who actually was infiltrating the party to possibly cause harm to somebody, the bride or the groom. So they were something that it was watched out for very carefully. In, in Matthew 25, we go through two, verse 2 and verse 4 says, if I can turn the pages. Now, five of them are wise and five of them are foolish. Now, those who were foolish took their lamps and took oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. So let me say that again. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil or no additional oil, but the wise took their lamps and vessels of oil. Now, to this point in the parable, this group of young ladies was referred to as one group. It's only at this point in telling the story that Jesus broke them down into two separate, separate groups, two subgroups. The wise, the ones who took the lamps and the amount of oil necessary, and the foolish, those who took their lamps and no extra oil. There are many believe that this is a picture of the church. And I'm not specifically saying, you know, Angle Lake Neighborhood Church, but the church in general. Until they started to have a problem with the amount of oil they were referred to as a group, that given tradition was probably together the entire time. There had been no division among them prior to this. The wise virgins were prepared, and they were watching and making sure that they had everything they needed and were awaiting the call of the bridegroom. The foolish were not prepared. They knew the call of the bridegroom could happen any minute, 
but they hadn't done anything that they needed to do. They weren't prepared. The church, you could think of universally, is made up of both wise and foolish. There are those who, of us who are waiting, we're working, we're watching, and then there's people who may be attending church who may, not, who may be going through the motions more or less. And we can look at the church today in the world, and I'm not interested in pointing fingers and saying this ministry does that, that ministry does that. I'm not interested in that at all. But we can safely say that much of the church is not active, and there's a word for that. And it's, I, I feel bad calling it out, frankly, but the word is apostate. <laughs> we are witnessing the embrace of ungodly doctrines. We see groups of people wanting to change or deconstruct Scripture and then reconstruct it again, put it back together in a way they think it should be. I was kind of taken aback by an article that somebody sent me, uh, someone I went to school with, where they... They have an idea now that they want to submit the Bible to this AI generator so that this AI can fix all the errors in the Bible. And I'm like, fix all the errors in the Bible? Are you kidding me? But the idea is to make it more palatable for people. And I don't think the Bible needs to be changed. I think it needs to be read. That's my conviction. We need to get back to reading the Bible, doing what it says. It doesn't need to be changed. The church encompasses a broad, broad spectrum of people, some converted, some not. And we can clearly see this in the message of Jesus as he, he wrote to the seven churches in the book of Revelation. He told many of those churches that they needed to repent or he'd come quickly. And I pray that he comes quickly anyway. So the church is not a true representation of Jesus, sadly. And that's unfortunate. And it's, but that within the church, God has a faithful remnant. It's something we need to know as a group of believers. God is never going to leave us without what we need. We had just talked about in Sunday school class, the Bible. And how it, it's, it has everything you need to be saved to grow as a Christian, and to be equipped for the work of God. It has everything we need. Just in the Old Testament, when they didn't have the New Testament scriptures, God had given them everything that they needed. It's a perfect, it's a beautiful example of God's provision for us. He gives us everything we need for what we need to do. We look and we see also in the, in the letters to the churches in, in Revelation, Jesus said to the church of Philadelphia, for instance, he said, you have kept my words, uh, the word of my patience. These were represented in the parable by the wise virgins. It was the wise virgins who had, had did what they were told to do. They knew what their role was and they stayed vigilant and they stayed prepared. Jesus warned his disciples after they asked when things uh, he was talking about in his Olivet Discourse would come to pass. We see his answer to them in the previous chapter, in chapter 24 of Matthew. And it's a familiar passage, so you don't need to turn there, but I'll just highlight it quickly. He said, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him saying, tell us when these things will be and what will be the signs of your coming at the end of the age. And Jesus answered and he said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars, rumors of wars. Is that happening anywhere? See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, there will be pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All of these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake, and then many will be offended and betray one another. 
and will hate one another. And many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Think about that. The love of many will grow cold. But he who endures until the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. And then the end will come. I like that uh, the Phillips translation, the New Testament translation, uh, states verses 10 through 12 a little differently. It says, then comes a time when many will lose their faith. I like how that's phrased. There will come a time when many lose their faith. And let me just, uh, I'll stray a little bit from the notes. But you know, it's very easy to become focused inwardly in a stressful situation. And we'll talk about this again. But when you lose your faith, you're not going to be outwardly focused. It says, the time may come when many will lose their faith and will betray and hate each other. And these words, I don't know about you, but these words grieve me. When I read them, I feel bad. There's something in my heart that's like, Lord, why does this have to happen? But they will betray each other. Yes, and many false prophets will arise and will mislead many people because the spread of wickedness, the love of most men will grow cold. Again, when I see this in this translation, the love of most men will grow cold. That means the people that stay engaged to the end are probably the minority. Is that a hard thing to hear? It's a hard thing to say. But this is the scripture. This refers to something, a period of time <clears throat> that we brought, uh, like again in Sunday school, brought up briefly, a time of what is called apostasy. And what that word simply means is a renunciation of religious or political belief. And you've seen in the media within the last uh, probably six months, there's been four, you know, people who are prominent in the, cult, uh, in the culture of Christianity or Christian music that have uh, stood up and said, I'm no longer a believer. That's a very, it can be damaging to the people who are in that culture, but it's something we need to understand that we need to dig in and we need to find out what it is. Paul wrote uh, this about a uh, great falling away in 2 Thessalonians. He said in 2 Thessalonians, uh, let no one deceive you, and you don't have to turn there, but uh, let no one deceive you by any means for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed and the son of perdition. Paul says again in his letter to Timothy in uh, chapter four, verse one, now the spirit expressly says, that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Luke notes in his gospel that Jesus, when explaining the parable of the sower, said in chapter 8, verse 13, he describes the seeds that are cast on rock. He says, but, and he says, but the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root who believe for a while and in the time of temptation fall away. I think we can all agree that the last three years have not been stellar. This has not been a good time for many groups of people. And we've seen it in the church as well. We've, we've taken our hits. So going back to the parable, we have this group of young ladies who are prepared for a wedding and wedding festivities, and we have those or not. So what becomes of them? So let's just finish off the, the rest of the story. Starting in uh, verse 6 of chapter 25, Matthew 25. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose, and they trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, 
lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell oil and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with them to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, other virgins come also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, I don't know you. Now, I got to admit to you, I'll be just perfectly transparent here. As a Christian, if somebody were to come to me and say, give me some of your oil, there's a huge part of me that's like, sure, happily, I'll give you some of my oil. But that's not the point that Jesus was making here. The point he was making is you're not prepared. I don't want to see, I, I can't. I can't, I look across this group of people, I bet you there's not one single person who could honestly say that you want somebody to be missing from the foot of the cross. Not a single one of us is wired that way. I certainly am not. I pray for revival. I pray for a harvest so that as many as possible are worshiping with us at the foot of Jesus Christ, at the cross. That's my desire. So it's difficult for me to say, I won't give you any oil. That's hard. That's a hard message. It's not a happy message. Oil in the scriptures always represents the Holy Spirit. Every, every single example, it points to the Holy Spirit. So the, the maidens who were not prepared and did not have adequate oil represent those who are trying to do the work of the ministry, the work of the gospel, all depending on their abilities, maybe, depending on their flesh to get things done. Some of the significant genius of mankind <clears throat> has been focused on schemes uh, and financing programs and church growth programs designed to grow really grand organizations that are designed to influence the world through business, perhaps, through politics, perhaps, or maybe through culture. Uh, <clears throat> I was debating, you know, it's, th there's a movement that I've, I've studied rather extensively over the years, and I was debating putting this in or not, but since I've mentioned it, I am putting it in. <clears throat> there's a, a movement that's not unique to the United States, but it's uh, active in many, many actually primarily Western cultures that believe that Christians need to come to greater influence and even control. I mean, take control of these uh, key areas of culture. And there are seven of them. One is education. Two is religion. Three is family. Fourth is business. Fifth is government and military. Sixth is arts and entertainment. And seven is media. Now, let's make no mistake here. Jesus Christ, and we're told clearly in the Bible, we are called to be salt and light. And we're called to be salt and light in every single one of these areas. We, we, that's our job. We need to be that Christian lawyer. We need to be that Christian doctor. We need to be that Christian teacher. They need us. They need it. This is a falling world, a failing world that needs Christian influence in every single one of these areas. So make no mistake, we're called to be influential. However, we're not commanded to take dominion over these areas in order to prepare the way for Jesus to come back. We need to be aware of these kind of philosophies. We'll talk a little more about philosophies. So then you had the five virgins who were prepared, not only with their lamps, but with an adequate amount of oil as well. These signify the people who are walking in the spirit. So you see the contrast to people who didn't, weren't ready. They're kind of doing things in their own flesh. And it, it's funny that prior to hearing the, um, the call for the bridegroom, they were sleeping. That's all, you know, uh, Jesus thought that, was a, an important enough detail to put in there. And that's, I think that's something we need to keep in mind. But 
those who were ready, who, who not only had their torch, but the amount of oil they needed as well, signify those who are walking in the Spirit, those, those who are filled with the Spirit. And those are the people who will guide and direct and, and contribute in, to the building of, of the church. Paul wrote in Romans uh, chapter 8, verse 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Notice that these bridesmaids, again, were all lumped together until that final cry came. That kind of shows us that maybe there's going to be a sifting that happens. At that final cry, the bridesmaids who were not prepared were away buying oil. And while they were gone, the bridegroom came. And they were not allowed entry into the wedding feast while those who were prepared were ushered into the marriage feast of the Lamb. When the unprepared finally got some oil and headed back to the feast, they were denied entry. Again, this is a, another part of the story. As a Christian, it grieves me. I, I don't want anybody who comes to celebrate with me or who comes to be a part of whatever we're doing, I don't want to say no. It's not... I'm not wired that way. I don't, I don't want to exclude anybody. But the point of the story was that they were not prepared. And in the end, the bridegroom said, I do not know you. And that's a hard phrase. That's a hard word. Because those, those young ladies, I'll call them young ladies, had been together for a year. All of this, everything was going fine uh, for an entire year, maybe even a little more. And then, at the last minute, the last part of the story, the bridegroom's coming. Then the division happens. That grieves me. I'm just being honest. It, gr it grieves my heart. The final verse of the parable, verse 13, kind of gives us a beautiful one-sentence summary of the story in Jesus said, watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Kind of sums up the story, doesn't it? So there may have been controversy with a bunch of scholars about what this, this actually means. But we know right here in Jesus' own words that the thrust of this story is, I'm coming back. And, and he was telling the story when he hadn't even left yet. Some scholars said that um, this particular, he told this particular story, and I laughed when I read this. He said it was um, April 2nd of AD 30 when he <laughs> told this story, which was just before Jesus' final Passover. How he knows that, I have no idea. I'd like to send him a you note know, and ask him, but I thought that was an interesting note. Anyway, what does it mean? So we have the story now. What does it mean? What do we, how do we move on from here? Now we know this story. We know that it's, it's a tragedy. Let's, let's be honest. There will there were be five that were not allowed into the marriage supper of the Lamb. And I'm telling you right now, we should grieve over every single soul that does not enter the kingdom of heaven. Every single soul. We had, a, we had a guest preacher who, came, who was one of the reasons that we ended up uh, here. Um, uh, Jason Stidham came and he did a, a sermon on hell, right? And I'm so, I've been to Bible school and I listened to what he said and my daughter, we got out in the car and she says, this is where we need to go to church. Could be based on what he had said about hell. He told us some interesting things that day. Hell is not designed for human beings. It was nowhere in God's plan that people go to hell. We, if we understand that, we need to grieve every single soul that goes there. So I, I, don't, I, I take no joy in this idea of excluding people. But then we have to ask, okay, where the rubber meets the road. What does it mean then to watch? What does it mean for us? 
as disciples of Jesus Christ to be watchful. There's a Christian author that I, I read often, and I was reading a book a couple of years ago, maybe several years ago, two Christian authors, uh, authors, one named Mark Hitchcock and the other Ed Heinsohn, and they tend to write <clears throat> things that are more related maybe to uh, in a prophetic nature, end times type stuff. But this particular book really didn't have that, that bend, but I'm doing most of it from memory. I'm trying to stay as faithful to it as I can, but I might have made a few minor changes. What does it mean to watch? And what do we need to do to be watchful? Number one, and I'll give you five total that I think is a good place for us to start. Number one, recognize the truth of God's word. Uh, the students in Sunday school are probably tired, about, tired of hearing me harp about the importance of this. As Tom, Pastor Tom preached eloquently, we have this and we have the Holy Spirit. And it's all we need. We can be sure that the Bible and what's in it is true. We can also rest assured that while the Bible tells us about God and Jesus and salvation and sin, it tells us about our own lives, and it also tells us that we need Jesus, and that's reliable. Those are facts. We need Jesus. Number two, realize that we, each of us, needs Jesus. So I jumped the gun a little bit. The Bible accurately predicts the future and gives us an accurate picture of the human condition apart from God. Don't you think that you can take this and you can read it and you can look at what's happening in culture today, right now? Can you see parallels? How many times have you heard somebody say, as in the days of Noah, aren't we there? How many times? Have, I mean, I've heard that many times. And it's so funny, and Jen, Jen and I talk about this. My parents were convinced back in the 70s that we were on the cusp of the rapture. <laughs> they looked at things going around them on then and were like, there's no way that we're going to, it's, it's imminent. I mean, it's, it's going to happen in the next couple of days. But here we are, 2023. But the truth in the Bible is the other important part is that we cannot get rid of sin on our own. Not going to happen. It would be great if maybe like Buddhists, we could do something, you know, we could do some nice things and recite some ancient Sanskrit or something and our sin would go away. But that's not how it works. The Bible tells us we can't get rid of sin on our own. It clearly tells us that our sins can only be washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's it. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that he died for us in our place. The theologians have a, a fancy phrase for that called substitutionary atonement. Jesus died in our place. And that's, the, that's the, the crux of it. And he did so that we may be brought back into fellowship with the Father and have everlasting life with our Creator. Because newsflash, you're going to have everlasting life anyway. The question is, where are you spending it? That's really the question. Number three, <clears throat> maybe the one I struggle with the most. Never lose sight of the fact that God is the one who's in control. It seems even from day to day, the world is getting more chaotic and more out of control. All you have to do is turn on the news, which, by the way, is something that I recommend you do not do. Because <clears throat> you're not really getting any facts from them anyway. Let's be honest. You're getting a narrative. You're not getting the news. Violence is increasing exponentially. There's crisis after crisis. And, you know, it wears us down, Christians, doesn't it? Doesn't it wear us down that there's a crisis every time you turn on the TV? 
turn off the TV. And what I'm trying to do, and I'm not telling you I've mastered it because I have not, is I'm trying to turn off the TV and pray and make it an automatic thing. We see morality being openly mocked. We saw it, I don't want to get kicked off YouTube, but we saw it this week at the White House. Morality being blatantly and openly mocked. Sometimes we feel like we're heading for a wreck and we can't do anything but buckle up and brace for impact. Whatever we are experiencing, we can hold on to one simple truth, and that is that Jesus is our Lord and that God has control and he's in charge. The next thing. And let me, t let me put in a little uh, disclaimer here. I tell you these things not because I've mastered them, but because I know that I, I need to. I need to work on them. I haven't figured it out. But I believe these are the ways that God speaks into our lives. Number four, be hopeful. Every way we turn, there is someone with a new philosophy. There are competing philosophies all over the world. But the truth is, and, and this, I really believe this is the truth, is that we can boil them down to two philosophies, and these are hope or despair. All of those philosophies can, will lead us to that direction. Either they lead us to a, an idea that we have something to be hopeful about, or we have something to despair. I'd rather be hopeful, but I will be completely transparent with you and tell you that that's not how I'm created. I, I go to the dark side sometimes and get in the whole despair thing. I have to make it a matter of prayer. Jesus, please touch my heart. Let me see the hope. Because I understand that I need to see the hope before I can tell others about the hope. And that's kind of my job. That's kind of what, as a Christian, that's what God has asked me to do, is to speak hope, speak life into people. It's easy to go the other way. Without Jesus and the hope that we will find and do find every day in his word, all of the other philosophies will end in a, in a bad place, a very murky, very dark existential doom. Uh, somebody, I was listening uh, to a podcast and was talking about listening to all this bad news. You know, there are people who actually are addicted to bad news. It blows me, you know, they, they listen to these, to these podcasts or these news programs because they like, they really dig being depressed. They really are fascinated by I see somebody shaking their head back there. There are people who really do like bad news. Stunning, right? But the exciting thing about the promise of Jesus is coming and the fact that he could return any single moment. He may not be, it may be years, to be honest with you, like my parents. When I was born, I was born in 1967. And there was a lady <coughs> at my parents' church that told my mom she was crazy for bringing a baby into this world because any minute, Christ is coming back and we're all going to be gone. Well, next month, I turn 56. Been here a long time waiting for that to happen. So I'm, I, I can openly say it's, it's taken some time. But the truth of the matter is, it could be before I finish the sentence. And we need to know that. We need to understand that. We need to internalize that fact. That we may not, the church office may not open on Tuesday because we're gone. That could happen. He may not come for years, but he could come today. And that's the story, what we see in, this, in the parable. Every day we can awaken and think, maybe today is a day every day. And you know what's good about that? I'll tell you. People say, oh, you know, I like to plan for the future. And I, I was, I remember being, um, uh, there was a period of time where I strayed away <clears throat> and I came back to the Lord and 
And I, people were like, you know, it could be any minute. And there was a part of me that said, no, I want to see my nephews and nieces and my daughters and my boys grow up. I want to see them accomplish these things or have these things. It took me a little period of time to get a little more spiritually mature enough to understand that there's not a single thing that my kids or my nieces and nephews or the kids I love are, can be given in this world that is better than what Jesus can give them. Nothing. Not a thing. So I abandoned that. It's our hope. The return of being caught up, it's our hope. And in the end, if we're honest about it, it's our only hope. Number five, and finally, reach out to others. And I kind of touched on this earlier. When hard times come, it's really difficult for us sometimes to be outreach oriented. You know, there's this desire to kind of pull in. And I think COVID did that to us. And, I, and I, I wish I could tell you I thought that that was just an unexpected consequence, but I don't think it was. It caused us to kind of draw in. Look at, you know, church attendance across the country was cut sometimes in half after COVID was over, if it's really over, and people are not coming back to churches. I, I, I don't think that was an accident, personally. But it's, it's, the point is, is it, it's easy to become focused internally, to stay internally focused. And I need to hurry. We can easily pull in and we can live a life that's self-absorbed, especially if we think we can get everything from a screen. If we think we can Zoom or look at our phones or whatever, and we can get everything we need from that, there's no reason for us to, to be outward focused. And all of our energy and all of our time can easily be spent on ourselves. Of all things that we can do as we wait for Christ's return, there's nothing more important. Hear me again. There's nothing more important than spreading the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We all encounter people every day. Make the most of that. I'm trying to remind myself that that, that encounter in Walmart or Safeway, is, maybe that's ordained, ordained by God. Maybe that person who is a couple dollars short and can't buy their groceries, maybe God put me there for a reason to say, oh, I can help you with that, and God bless you. And there's an understanding that comes along with that, that maybe it's not your job to plant the seed. Maybe it's your job to water it. Maybe you plant a seed and maybe you get to harvest. But do what God calls you to do in that process. It may not always be us guiding someone down the Romans road. It may not be... Uh, Thank you, I was going to mention. <laughs> it may not be uh, waiting, waiting to, to harvest the field, but it might be just putting some water on the seed planted by somebody else through an act of kindness. Even a smile can make a big difference. I was reading in Iran currently, it's going through a vast number of Christian conversions. Scholars note that the fastest growing religion in that region is Christianity, and the fastest shrinking religion in that region is Islam. God's moving. God's moving. He's speaking to some of these people through dreams. You can, you, there's a, a Voice of the Martyrs is a, is a kind of interesting uh, outlet where they, they're speaking. God, Jesus is meeting these people in their dreams, and they're waking up knowing that they have to be saved. It's a beautiful thing. This is happening. Time might be short. We need to pray that we are faithful in the situations where God has placed us. We also need to pray for those who are preaching and teaching the word of God in places that we ourselves cannot go. I think of Pastor Tom is going to be going back to chaplaincy. 
You and I can't go into a prison. Pastor Tom can. We need to pray and support him in that effort. Pray for those Christian workers who are laboring to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ.